Okay, does anybody remember where we were? I, I, six. Seven, sixteen. Okay. I know, I was kidding. I was kidding. Six, seventeen. Okay. Where are we? Now, why did we stop there? Okay, well, I guess we did, but... Okay, go ahead. The sons of Gershon by clans were Lidni and Shimei. Shimei. Okay. The sons of Kohath were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived 133 years. Okay, once again, they give the age of Kohath in there. And the reason why they're doing that is so that you can determine both the time in Israel and the, the, the time from creation. There are certain people that you will be able to follow. Kohath is one of them. Um, I want to turn to something real quickly. Let me, let me check this before I do. And I want to show you something that uh, it may not be in here. I, I may have a different person. If I do, I'll try, I'll try to remember to look this up for you all next time. But uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Um, 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, all right. Um, somewhere in here, and this is not the reference. They, they gave me a reference, um, Gersh, about the... Um, oh, where is it? Gersh on here. It doesn't say it. Um, uh, oh, okay, 616, it says the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, um, uh, all, as in verses 1, 17, 20, 43, 62, and 71. Now, there is a place in Chronicles, and I don't know which one, they, they gave all of those, those names, but if you go back and look at uh, Moses' son's name, his name is Gershom, not Gershon. Okay, but in one place where it says something very unfavorable about something happening in the line of Gershom, they changed the name to Gershon. And that's to direct attention away from Moses. They don't want, you know what I'm saying? And so, I, just so you know, that's in there. And now Gershon here is the son of, these are the, the son of Levi. Okay, so you've got Gershon and you've got Gershom. And so instead of picking on Moses, they moved it back to the other guy, but it's quite apparent what they did. And that's one, remember I told you there's a few places where the Masoretic text has some little variants. Yes? That's, I believe what you're looking for is in 1 Chronicles 6. Okay, that's where I am right now, and I don't see the, the context of it. One of them, 1 Chronicles 6 does say Gershon, um, but uh, 16... And in 20, it says Gershon. Right, 20, but in... 16, it says Gershon, but it's saying he's the son of Levi. Um, in 20, uh, once again, uh, yeah, so there's different Gershon and Gershom. And one of them is clearly speaking of Moses' son, but it doesn't say Gershom. And yes? I don't understand. Who is it that made that difference? The, the Masoretic text. That, that This is what we were talking about last week, I think, in the, maybe this yeah. class. Maybe it was. No. Anyway. The, the Masoretic text is the text that the Hebrew people, the, 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 you know, the people that came out of, what am I trying to say, from the, the Jewish people after the crucifixion, after the destruction of Rome, they had not accepted Jesus. And that is the main text on which the King James Version, the New King James Version, etc. is based on, is the Masoretic, Masoretic text. The Masoretes... It means counters, and they would count everything. And they knew the number of how many words there were, how many letters there were, and they were able to tell if this text is corrupted because of these, the way they counted and determined things. Anyway, um, there are several places in the Bible where they have manipulated that text, okay? And mostly it is to diminish the work of Jesus, okay? But in one case, you can see where they didn't want Moses having something brought upon him, and I'll find it. Uh, it, I, I don't see it right in front of me. The Masoretes are the ones that wrote this, though? No, they didn't write it. They took the Bible, and they kept copying it down through the ages. The oldest Masoretic text that we have is from about the year 1000, right? 1030, I think, is the oldest Masoretic text. Okay? They were the ones that kept the Hebrew Bible okay, preserved after they were exiled. The Bible code years ago. Right, that's what the Bible code is based on. But, but very minimally adulterated. And the way that they know this is, in other words, here's what we have. And I don't want to go through this again, but I'll explain real quickly. If you go to the 22nd Psalm, 
it has a corruption in there. That's where the one, one it says, uh, they pierced my hands and my feet, right? In the Masoretic text, it doesn't say that. It says, like a lion's claw, my hands and my feet, which makes no sense at all. Right, but what they did is they had to amend the text to take out, they pierced my hands and my feet because it so clearly showed Jesus. So when the King James Version got to that particular verse, and they know that it's wrong, they went to a lesser Hebrew manuscript which says it correctly. These other manuscripts that have survived. The Latin Vulgate, which predates the Masoretic text, was translated from Hebrew manuscripts way back. It also says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Right? Then the, the Isaiah 53, the part about the uh, uh, his soul shall see the light of life, which is not in the Masoretic text, but it is in the Latin, well, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which predates Jesus. In other words, when something has a corruption in it, God has preserved enough other texts to prove the original. Okay, so when the Masoretes have manipulated something, they're doing that to their own peril. But it's not really, in the end, affecting us because we have the Septuagint, we have the Samaritan Pentateuch, we have the, and now, as of 1947, as I said, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. They predate Jesus, and they're the oldest known Hebrew manuscripts, and they confirm the Christian Bible, not the Hebrew Masoretic text. Okay, so, you know, and it just happens that they came out in 1947, one year before Israel was reestablished. So don't ever worry that we have a corrupt Bible. We don't. It's that people have to spend a lot of their life making sure that what they are translating is from the proper... These three texts say this, this one doesn't, this one has obviously got a bias in it. We know that this is correct. Plus, these are much older than this. Right? They know. There, there's no doubt about the Bible that we have in our hands. Unless you have an agenda. Now, here's an example from, from the New Testament. Here's an example. You have in the book of Revelation the number 666, the devil. Okay? There are thousands of manuscripts. We have 5,686 manuscripts in the Greek, and they're finding new ones all the time that are ancient manuscripts, right? They all say 666, all of them. No problem. Plus, we have what are called lectionaries. These are uh, things that people wrote about the Bible in the early church. You know, they'd make commentaries on it. And it, lectionary may be sermons, for example. We could reconstruct the entire Old, uh, New Testament, the entire New Testament from these extra biblical sources except 11 verses. The entire New Testament. They'll say in 2 John 3, and then they'll make their sermon or whatever. And we could take that entire Bible and put it back together without ever having the original text. So no problem there, except 11 verses. But um, there is a text that says the number 616 instead of 666, okay? Well, guess what the Praetorists like to do, the people that believe that everything has already been fulfilled. They always defer to this one obscure text that doesn't have any relevance at all. Why? Because you can take the name of Emperor Nero, you can convert it out of its original language into another language, and you can come up with 616, and he was the emperor at the time. Well, that proves that Emperor Nero was the Antichrist, right? Stupid. First you have to use a bad translation of his name, and then you have to convert it into numbers to a number that doesn't match all the other Bibles, all the other manuscripts, I'm sorry, in the Bible. So people will use a certain text when it benefits them. So are you saying that the New King James Version is really the best translation? No, 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 no. Uh, but I will tell you this, and I'm glad you asked this because it's important to know. I use the New King James Version because it's based on the same text as the King James Version. And I believe personally, personally, this isn't to affect anybody else. I just believe that this is the best text. I believe that. But um, it, the, what you have, and I'll show you how this works, is you've got two texts. This is uh, what we'll call the Greek New Testament. Greek New Testament. And you've got here two Thanks. You've got what's called the Byzantine, B-Y-Z, Byzantine text, which is what the King James and the New King James and the Geneva Bible, all these older Bibles are based on. Now, there are other things that go into there. There's something called what's the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. And that's uh, this tradition, but many of these texts, this one guy named Desiderius Erasmus compiled all of them into one text, and they call it the TR. So if you ever see the initials TR, it means Textus Receptus, which means the Received Text. And so people say, well, this is God's Received Text. 
when it's not. It's just a compilation of these other ones. The term received actually came from a stamp on it when they received it at the printer's office. It says received. But people say this is God's, you know, so you've got to be careful with what people say. But the, this is the Byzantine. Then you have what's called the Alexandrian text. Alexandrian text, all right? And this one is from Alexandria, Egypt. This one is from the Byzantine Empire. So you have the two empires of, you know, the branches of the Roman Empire. The NIV, for example, will be, be based on this. And it does have differences. Understand, none of them are doctrinal in nature that will affect your actual doctrine. They have things that are, maybe this verse is here instead of here, backwards. Or they'll have, you know, some words that are missing. Like it says, um, Jesus says, I am not going yet to this festival in one text. But it says, I'm not going to this festival in another. And people say, well, that makes him a liar, right? Whatever. It, so there are these differences that are in these texts. This one, if you're talking to somebody that holds only to this text, they're going to say, well, Egypt was always a hotbed of apostasy. And you're going to hear people say, if you bring that up, and that's their way of dismissing this text. Well, it's a hotbed. And I, I get so sick of people just repeating everybody else saying that. Saying, it's a hotbed of apostasy. Everything that comes out of Egypt is bad. Well, that's a fallacy of source. In other words, you don't say just because the source is a bad place that the text that comes out of it is a bad place. That's like saying that the source of the Quran is Islam and therefore everything in the Quran is wrong. The Quran isn't all wrong. It says God is merciful. That's correct. But if you say the Quran is all wrong, then you're just speaking a fallacy. So you've got to be careful when you come up with these. But these are the two major texts. There are other things involved in the NIV as well, but the NIV, what I like about the NIV is it always footnotes differences. In this text, it says this, right? It's always telling you the differences in the text. Down, that's why I say read the footnotes. Forget the commentaries. I, you know, commentaries are, that's like listening to me here. Go home and check anyway, but the, the footnotes tell you all of these things, and that's what's important. The, Hebrew manuscripts, same thing. We've got thousands of different ways of coming up with your translation of the Bible. Are you going to use this, this, and this? And then here's, I'll give you one more example, which I don't think I've brought up in this class, and if I have, just shut me up. But the Jehovah's Witnesses in the New World Translation of the Bible do something different. They have, from the, the, the New Testament, they go to what are called J manuscripts, J1, J5, J15. And the J manuscripts are Jehovah manuscripts. And what they are is they are Hebrew translations of the New Testament. Okay? Guess what? The very first Hebrew translation of the New Testament was done by a guy named Hashem. He was a Hebrew. And why did he do it? Do you have any idea why he would translate the New Testament when he wasn't a believer? It was a polemic or an argument against Christianity. And so instead of Jesus, he put in the name Jehovah, Jehovah. And they used that Against Christianity. He was violently against Christianity. They use that as one of their source texts. And then, of course, they have another one. Listen to the logic here. And you try to explain this to them, and they won't listen. You come down here from the Greek, okay? And you've got a, these are the original. And what they do is they translate from the Greek into Hebrew. All right? And then what do they say? Oh, here's an example. On this, on the top of this particular J, we'll say it's J13, I have no idea. It says, translated for His Majesty the King, or translated for Her Majesty the Queen, whichever one it is. It, from the original languages, meaning Greek, into Hebrew. So they did a translation from the Greek into Hebrew. So the original uses the word Kyrios, which is Lord, okay? But they decided to translate this particular instance of Lord as Jehovah, okay? And so what do the Jehovah's Witnesses do? They say this is speaking about Jehovah and not Jesus. When in fact, the word is the same for Lord all the way through the New Testament. Kyrios, Kyrios, Kyrios. So their, their New World Translation is utterly corrupt. Completely. It's not based on the originals at all. It's based on copies of the originals by fallible people. But they hold to this and they say, this goes back to the originals. When it doesn't. So you've got to be really careful when you listen to people. This is a... Huge, huge science. It's called textual criticism. And people spend their entire life do devoting their life to going back to thousands of manuscripts. And they get into the, you know, now they have it on microfiche. It's a lot easier. But there is a lot of work in coming up with a single translation of the Bible. And you've got to be very, very careful about how you handle this when you're doing that. Because 
This, this really is God's Word. There's no doubt about it. And am I going to go with this text, the Alexandrian, or am I going to go with this text, the Byzantine? What am I going to do? And why? 